You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode's a talk by Chris Gilbo about his new book, The Hundred Dollar Startup. Uh, the talk took place in Shoreditch, London, on the 25th of May, and I went to see it, and Chris very kindly gave me permission to record it and publish it uh, for this podcast. And I really enjoyed the talk. I, I very much agree with Chris's approach to entrepreneurship, and I really appreciate his interest in entrepreneurship as a way of getting more freedom in your life, which is very much what this podcast is all about as well. And I'll put some links in the show notes, but just as a background, uh, Chris Gilbo uh, writes the blog The Art of Nonconformity, and he's already written one book called The Art of Nonconformity. And he's in his early 30s, he's doing a project to um, travel to every country in the world, and he's nearly finished. And as far as I understand, he's always worked for himself or been an entrepreneur in one way or another. And this new book is really about how to use creative self-employment, um, small business and solo entrepreneurship to give yourself uh, more freedom in your life. Um, I haven't read the book yet, um, but I'm very much looking forward to reading it and I might do a review of it in future. But I think the talk is full of really useful information. I'm sorry about the audio quality. It was a public lecture, so it's not great quality. During the um, Q&A session, I've actually cut out the questions because the mic wasn't picking them up. But Chris pretty much summarizes the questions in each of his answers. So you should be able to um, make sense of, of uh, what the questions were from that. So I hope you enjoy the talk and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Cindy. That's so kind. Um, really appreciate Macmillan publishing a $100 startup here in the UK and around the Commonwealth as of yesterday. And um, thanks so much to everyone who brought cupcakes. You saw there's a whole cupcake station over here on my right. Um, someone even made $100 startup cupcakes. It's awesome. It's amazing. And um, really appreciate everyone who arranged the space, people taking photos. Uh, and most importantly, thanks to all of you uh, for coming to share this evening together. Great, so I came in from Heathrow the other day, and uh, thanks for arranging the beautiful weather, first of all. I'm sure it's like this every day. And, um, second of all, um, I came in and I saw all these flags everywhere, and I said, well, I really appreciate you know, the, the welcome of the Jubilee celebration of the $100 startup. That's great. You guys are awesome, amazing. Um, so I'm so excited to be here tonight. And uh, what I thought we'd do, I know a lot of you are standing, and I don't want to take a great deal of your time. I don't want to lecture for a long time. And this is ostensibly uh, a book event, but I'm going to assume that all of you are literate, so you don't actually want me to read to you from it, so we won't have a $100 startup bedtime story. I will um, just talk about why I wrote the book and tell you a couple of stories uh, from the book and talk about what I hope will come out of it. Um, so we'll do that for about 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll do what I call questions and attempted answers for a bit, uh, which is always variable, but I'm sure in London it'll be great. And then I'll hang out, um, I think I'll be sitting over there, and I'll sign books. Um, even if you don't want a book, that's fine, just come and say hi. And I always say that uh, the best thing about any Art of Nonconformity meetup, or now any $100 startup event, uh, is not really this formal space where I'm kind of projecting and talking with all of you, um, but the best thing is really all of the other people who come. And uh, from the people who've come from far away or from near away, I really hope, uh, even if you're a shy, introverted person like I can be, um, you should definitely meet someone because everyone here is awesome. Um, so that's what we'll do. So, you know, the first thing to say, um, whenever you undertake a big project, um, whenever you do something that's going to require a lot of your time and your energy, I always think it's good to define your own success. I think it's good to decide for yourself uh, what success is going to look like, as opposed to letting someone else decide that for you. And in the case of writing a book, uh, it's really important to understand to whom you're writing. So it's important to understand you know, who's the audience for this book, as well as maybe who is, who's not the audience. 
You know, in, in the case of this book, uh, I received some really good advice uh, from my editor in the beginning of this project. Uh, authors are always supposed to complain about their publishers. It's like a tradition. Uh, but unfortunately, I have nothing but good things to say about my publisher, uh, both in the US and, of course, here in the UK as well. I got some really good advice. And my editor said, Chris, um, you use this word entrepreneur a lot. And uh, maybe in some of the circles that you travel in, everyone understands what you're talking about. Maybe on Twitter, maybe with your blog, you know, people understand what you mean. But uh, you know, for a lot of mainstream America or mainstream rest of the world, um, people think different things. You know, when they hear that word entrepreneur. So for a lot of people, you know, when they when they think about being an entrepreneur, not necessarily everyone aspires to that. And a lot of people might be intimidated by that idea, or even turned off, or they think that you know, being an entrepreneur is uh, moving to Silicon Valley or Silicon Alley and uh, begging for money, you know, trying to find venture capital and angel investing, and you know, essentially trying to, to build something you know, very large. And that's not what the $100 startup is about at all. And the other conception that people have sometimes about business um, is that business um, is something that uh, you do when you wear a suit, or it's something that you do when you play golf, um, or if you're a business person, then you vote for the conservative party. You know, so there's all these different associations of entrepreneurship and business, um, and that's not necessarily you know what the hundred dollar startup is all about. Um, and so Cindy said it very well when she described uh, the audience uh, for this book, and that audience is essentially uh, those people who are seeking to have more freedom in their lives. Uh, and so that audience includes those who are dissatisfied with their work. Um, it's for those uh, who are working jobs they would like to leave. Um, maybe they hate their job, or maybe they're just ready to move on. Uh, or in some cases, they like their job, but they would like to create more security for themselves. They would like to create another income and have something else they can rely on. Uh, but they don't necessarily know what to do. Um, they don't know what the next step is. And so there's a lot of resources that are good, um, but they're primarily motivational, and they're kind of inspiring, and they're like, you should go for it, and I think that's great. But uh, when you're ready to go for it, where do you go? And what do you do? You know? And so uh, what I hope to do with the book is uh, you know, provide 300 pages of next steps and an action plan, and something that's very specific. You know, to tell people, okay, when you're ready to do something, then here's what you can do. Um, so that's the first group, and the second group is um, those who are um, just now entering the job market, or perhaps struggling to enter the job market, uh, or perhaps trying to compete in a crowded, difficult uh, economy. People of all ages. Um, so I don't know entirely what the situation is here, um, but where I live in Portland, Oregon, uh, it's not unusual at all to go to the coffee shop and your barista that makes your coffee has a master's degree, or sometimes higher, and uh, you meet all kinds of people, you know, who are very qualified and have all kinds of education, but yet they're not able to find work in the field in which they trained. And last year uh, in Portland, Oregon, there was an advertisement for uh, a receptionist position, a very entry-level job, um, that paid a very low wage with no benefits, and uh, more than 300 people showed up to apply for that job. Uh, many of them had college degrees. And so uh, you know, many of them had been to university, some of them had experience, and so when you have uh, so many people you know, competing for such few jobs, uh, or even jobs that have a little advancement opportunity. Uh, I don't think that when those people are unsuccessful, I don't think that something is wrong with them. I don't think that the answer for them is that they should just try harder. You know, polish your CV, practice your interview questions. Um, I would say that um, something is actually fundamentally wrong with the system. And the answer isn't necessarily, you know, create more jobs. The answer isn't necessarily a political answer or an educational answer. I think that the answer for many of those people, perhaps many of us, uh, is found through creative self-employment. The answer is found through taking matters into our own hands and thinking differently about risk. Um, it used to be that being an entrepreneur, quote, um, was the risky choice. You know, and you would say if someone's going out on their own, they're taking a big risk. Um, but now I kind of think for a lot of people they're saying it's actually risky to compete you know, in this crowded job market and it's actually the safe, conservative choice um, to you know, take matters into my own hands. Uh, and so that's uh, who the book is for. And the best way to tell you more about the $100 startup model is to tell you a couple of stories um, of people who are in the book. So when we began the research, um, we cast a really wide net. 
We said we want to hear from people from all over the world. We want it to be fully international, very diverse. Uh, we want to hear from people from all different backgrounds, you know, young people, older people, uh, from operating all kinds of different businesses. Uh, but we also had some very specific characteristics. And we said, uh, okay, to be in the business, you know, to be in the study, you know, your business actually has to make a significant income. You know, so I'm not looking at hobbies. You know, I'm looking at something you can actually support your family with. Uh, and then you also have to be willing to talk very specifically about that income and talk about the finances and talk about how much it costs to start your business and what went well and what did not go well along the way. Um, and again, the reason I do that is because we, we don't want to present something that's generic. You know, we want to present something that's actually you know, very data-driven. Um, and then for the most part, we're looking at businesses that were run by fewer than five employees. And in many cases, um, the business was just operated by one person, which is how I run my business as a solopreneur. So probably half the people in the study are just you know, one person, maybe with their partner, maybe they have a couple of assistants or something, but it's primarily just one person you know, owning that business. And then lastly, uh, you had to operate this business um, using no special skills or no highly technical skills. Um, you don't need an advanced you know, engineering or computer science degree to do it. Um, and what I mean is uh, by no special skills, uh, it doesn't mean that you have no skills at all. It means no skills that someone could not easily acquire. Um, so for example, there was a guy who started a coffee bar and he didn't have much experience doing that before, but he learned how to do that. Uh, on the other hand, heard from someone in Croatia who said he had taught himself dentistry. And I said, that's great, I'm like, wow, good for you. Um, but I'm not putting it in the book, because uh, I'd probably get sued. I live in America, and uh, I'd, I'd also get negative comments on my blog, which is worse. Uh, so you know, I want to find people who have all kinds of different businesses. And I want to put them in this study, and then we want to tell their story well, but we also want to craft, as Cindy said, a blueprint you know, for readers to take action. Uh, and one of the first stories I heard in fact, the first story that's in the book uh, is the story of Michael Hanna. And Michael was a 25-year uh, career sales representative. Uh, he'd been in media sales you know, his entire career. And uh, he had lots of experience. He was a good worker. And uh, one day, three years ago, he went to work in a big office building. And he was preparing his meetings and pitches and different things. Uh, and his boss asked to see him. So Michael went into her office, and uh, he noticed that she didn't make eye contact with him. And uh, she said, you know, Michael, as you're aware, um, the industry's you know, kind of in a downturn right now, and we had to make some tough choices. And Michael said, uh, you know, at that point, it was almost like everything happened in slow motion for him. And he said, you know, I had known, you know, I had heard stories of this happening with other people, and you know, some of our colleagues have lost their jobs. Uh, but until that day that it happened to me, I didn't really know what it felt like. Uh, and you know, he's sitting there in the office, and there's someone from Human Resources comes in and gives him a box, and he has to pack up all his things from his desk and leave right away. And uh, on the, the ride home, he calls his wife, Mary Ruth, and he says, uh, Honey, I'm sure it's going to be okay, um, but I'm just letting you know I lost my job today. So everything was okay for Michael, but not in the way that he first expected. At first, Michael thought, you know, I'm a great worker, got good experience, good references, uh, I'll just get another job. And so he started, you know, doing all the things he was supposed to do to try to get another job. He called his friends, his colleagues, you know, old contacts, he used LinkedIn, he lined up different interviews. Uh, but what he discovered pretty quickly was, uh, first of all, you know, he wasn't the only person looking for work. And second of all, because his industry wasn't a downturn, um, there weren't really any companies hiring. Uh, so, you know, one day as he's driving around, uh, his friend, who owns a furniture store, calls him. And uh, his friend says, I know this is kind of random, but uh, I have a truckload of mattresses that I don't want. Uh, maybe you can sell these, you know, one at a time on Craigslist, uh, which I think is like Gumtree here, or uh, eBay or something. And, you know, Michael said, okay. Um, so he calls his wife again, you know, Mary Ruth, and he says, honey, it's a long story. Uh, but is it okay if I buy a truckload of mattresses? Um, and she says, okay, Michael, whatever, you know. So Michael buys the mattresses, um, but instead of just selling them online, um, he had noticed when he was driving around to these fruitless job interviews that uh, there was a car dealership that had gone out of business recently. And because, you know, the whole economy in the U.S. at the time was, was you know, spiraling downward, there was no other kind of car dealership moving in. So Michael thought, uh, maybe I, you know, if I contact the developer, maybe I can actually rent that space 
you know, for a, a low rate. It'll be pretty cheap, and it was. So Michael rented the space. And then he didn't know much about mattress stores. Uh, in fact, his whole impression of mattress stores was that, was that they were kind of high pressure, you know, seedy places. You didn't really want to go there unless you had to. Uh, and so Michael decided to create uh, an unconventional mattress shop. And he decided to create a family, fr family friendly atmosphere with a play area for children uh, and a coffee bar on the side. Uh, and then Michael started uh, the world's first mattress delivery by bicycle service, uh, which you can see on YouTube. It's very popular. And uh, you know, he just kind of kept learning as he went along. Um, and uh, two years later, uh, Mattress Lot is now a $1 million a year business. And I caught up with Michael recently before the book came out, and he told me two things. Uh, he said, first of all, you know, if you had told me a couple of years back, um, you know, when I was in my corporate job that I would be you know, operating a mattress store, you know, I never would have imagined that. Um, you know, but I'm glad that it worked out, and we feel like we're really contributing to our community, and our whole family's involved in this. Uh, and the second thing he said was, um, you know, losing my job um, was a big shock, but it turned into the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'm actually glad that that happened, um, because it forced you know, me to relook at things and make this whole transition. And as I talked with people from you know, all over the world, I heard a lot of sentiments, like Michael's. Um, they didn't all lose their jobs and you know, open a retail shop. But uh, a lot of people talked about this unexpected moment um, when they became a business owner, when they kind of followed this passion and created a business model around it. Uh, and as I did a lot of different interviews, uh, I, I learned to kind of adjust my questions uh, in response to this phenomenon. So I talked with uh, Susanna Conway from here in England. And Susanna was a former journalist, and she was also a photographer, you know, just as a hobby. And uh, one day she decided to offer a photography course, um, mostly to her friends and family. And uh, everyone signed up and filled up. And then uh, she wasn't a famous blogger. She didn't have you know, tens of thousands of followers on Twitter or anything. But she knew some people, and she had a Facebook account. So then she you know, offered that photography course to other people. Uh, and that photography course uh, now, and her other courses, now earns uh, more than 60,000 pounds a year. And when I asked Susanna, what did you not foresee when you were starting up? She said, I didn't know I was starting up. I just thought I was you know, doing something fun and then everyone wanted to pay me for it. Um, and uh, I talked with Benny Lewis, uh, who's originally from Ireland, now travels the world um, as a professional language hacker, uh, learning foreign languages and teaching other people methods of learning languages. And uh, at the end of one of our talks, I said, uh, is there anything else I should know about your business? And he said, yes, um, please stop calling it a business. I'm just having the time of my life. You know, I'm just doing something that I love to do. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I found a way not just to do what I love to do, um, but to make that something useful for other people. And I found a way to kind of connect you know, this concept of following my passion with something that other people care enough you know, to pay for. And so in, in one way or another, um, you know, every case study in the book, as well as uh, you know, many of the self-employed or entrepreneurs who are here tonight and in our whole community, uh, in one way or another, that's what they figured out how to do. You know, how to really like focus in on something that, that they enjoy, that they appreciate, that they are skilled in, uh, and then connect that you know, to this desire in the marketplace to make it useful. Um, and for the most part, they do it without spending a lot of money. There's no need to write a 60-page business plan that no one's ever going to read. There's no need to go to the bank, you know, to beg for money. Um, the bank will give you money when you don't need it, essentially. Um, most of them started their business uh, for well under a thousand U.S. dollars, and uh, about half of them for less than a hundred U.S. dollars. Um, so here in the U.K., you also have a currency advantage. You save even more money. That's great. <laughs> And um, all of them, for the most part, started this business, uh, as I said, um, without any special skills, but perhaps uh, a repositioning of the skills that they already had. Uh, so I talked with Sarah Young, uh, who opened a yarn store uh, at the height of the recession. And all these other businesses were closing down, and she didn't have experience doing this. And I said, you know, what were you thinking? You know, why did you think uh, this shop would succeed? And she said, well, I wasn't an entrepreneur, but I was a shopper. And I knew what I wanted, and it didn't exist. So I found a way to bring it. I figured I wasn't the only one you know, who wanted this. So I started Happy Nets. Uh, 
And you may have seen uh, the video book trailer for The $100 Startup. If you did, Sarah is in that trailer, and she tells the story of making her first $1,000 in a day. And she tells the story of calling her dad on the phone, and she says, Dad, you know, the store made $1,000, and she talks about how that made her feel. Um, so we made that trailer a few months ago, and I caught up with her right before the book came out, uh, and I asked if there's any updates. And she told me the story of uh, how Happiness hosted a festival, and you know, knitters from all over came in, and they had their first $10,000 day. You know, and now happiness employs uh, four or five people. Um, so again, you know, I, I tell these stories, I write these stories in the book, you know, with, with the goal of honoring them because I found them very inspiring myself, um, but then also with providing that blueprint uh, for other people to take action, you know, and other people to you know, create their own success story. And I hoped to provide such a barrage of case studies, so many different stories, that no one could say, I can't do that. Because it's very easy, if you tell the story from your own perspective, it's very easy for someone to say, oh, I could never do it because you know, I'm not like that person. Or that person has some advantage you know, over me, that person's different. Um, but when we look at people from all over the world, different family structures, you know, different kinds of businesses, um, you know, it is possible, and a lot of people have done it. So um, I said in the beginning that it's important to define your own success, to decide for yourself um, what success will look like. And in the case of the $100 startup, um, I think the book will be successful uh, if it does three things. And the first thing is um, inspiration combined with action. I hope that uh, people will read the book and not only say, oh, it was a good book. I hope that they will read the book and say, you know, I read this book and then I, I thought differently about something and I took action on it. And maybe I, you know, I, maybe I did my first uh, you know, $100 startup, or if I already had a business, maybe there's some things that I could you know, do to improve you know, or tweak, uh, or just to kind of you know, ramp things up a little bit. Um, so I hope, that, I hope that people will be inspired to do something. Uh, I talk a lot about freedom, both on the blog and in the book, and the question that I would have for all of us is, uh, do you have enough freedom in your life? Uh, are you doing you know, what you love most of the time? Because all of us have things that we have to do from time to time that we don't necessarily love or enjoy, and that's fine. Um, but most of the time, you know, is most of your work meaningful? Do you have enough freedom? And then because freedom and responsibility are correlated, you know, are you giving enough? You know, are you making the world a, a better place? And the second thing that I hope will come out of the book um, is education. Uh, for all those people who are ready to do something but don't know what the next step is. Uh, and so we've tried you know, to be very specific with lots of checklists and plans and examples and case studies uh, and data that's in the book and also available online. Um, I really want to remove excuses you know, so that people know exactly what they can do. And the third and final thing that I hope um, will come out of the book, I hope, it will, uh, I hope it will create a sense of urgency among those who read it. Uh, because we live in this uh, beautiful, remarkable age where you know, hundreds of us can come together in London and hang out and talk about how to start a business you know, for $100 or less. And then we can go online, we can connect with tens of thousands of people from all over the world um, based on shared interests and beliefs and values. It doesn't necessarily matter where we live you know, or what passport we hold. Uh, we can connect with like-minded people from everywhere. So in the story of uh, micro-businesses, it's important to say that micro-businesses have always existed since the beginning of commerce. You know, people have been buying and selling. Um, and I used to live on a hospital ship off the coast of West Africa, and I could get in my Land Rover and drive in the interior of Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. And uh, in the interior of Sierra Leone, uh, everyone is an entrepreneur. You know, everyone is working for themselves. Uh, everyone is buying and selling and hustling, you know, to make their way. Um, but the difference is, if you live you know, in the village in West Africa, uh, you can pretty much only buy and sell you know, with those people who are around you, you know, with your immediate community, whereas we can connect with all kinds of people. And so I think that's very rare and special, um, and I think it creates the sense of freedom, but also you know, the opportunity to help others uh, to make the world a better place. And so something that I like that Steve Jobs said before his death, uh, he said, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. And all the stories in the book, as well as many of the stories from our community here tonight and elsewhere, um, I find them living testaments you know, to that belief, that belief that we can do something that we love, um, we can find this freedom, 
and we can also find it you know, by adding value um, to the world. And so I'm just honored to be a, a small part of that. And people often ask me uh, about inspiration because I have this project where I'm visiting every country in the world and uh, you know, people have said, oh, this you know, has inspired a, sort of, a certain thing. And I say, oh, that's great. Um, but you know what inspires me is really um, all of the people who connect with it, um, which is why I said, you know, everyone here is doing unconventional, remarkable things. Uh, and so uh, I'm grateful again uh, to Cindy and everyone at Macmillan for bringing this book to the UK. And I'm grateful uh, to all of you for sharing this evening here with me. Thanks. in a moment, but uh, shall we do some questions and attempted answers? <laughs> How do I define hustle? Um, I define hustle, uh, I relate it to the word marketing or networking, which is kind of an older definition of um, connecting with people. So uh, I think of hustling as um, bringing awareness to your business or project. In fact, I think in the book I call it the gentle art of self-promotion. So a lot of people sometimes have hang-ups over like, how do I market my business? You know, how do I, you know, connect with people? And so um, I really, uh, for me, I base it a lot on relationships. Uh, and so people sometimes ask uh, how I define divide my time. And roughly 50% of what I try to do is create. I try to write books and blog posts and different features and create products and all these things. And the other 50% is connecting. Um, so meeting people and uh, answering emails and seeing how I can be of service. Um, so hustling is kind of combining all those things. Great. So the question is, how do you handle a big idea? Um, I think you almost answered it in the end when you said um, you bring it from a big idea to a small idea. And the first thing I would say is um, sometimes when people are trying to figure out like uh, what what is my business model, what am I going to do, um, they're very focused on this question of innovation. And uh, they're like, how am I going to like, create something that's never been made before and do something that's never been done before? Um, but that's not usually how it works. You know? uh, most of the time, you're not necessarily making the next iPhone. You know? If you can do that, that's great. Um, but if not, there are many, many business models that can come out of simply being useful. And so I focus on the question of usefulness and how is your business or your idea going to help people? Now, how it goes from big to small, um, which is why I say like sometimes a big idea is overrated, or innovation is overrated, and usefulness is better. But um, you know, if you do have that big idea, that's great. It just needs to be broken into steps. You know, it needs to be broken down. I'm like, here's the outcome. Here's what I want to do, and then how do I make that happen? And what's the you know what's the very last step that needs to happen before that's successful? And then the step before that, and then before that, you know, um, when I do things like. Um, you know, I say uh, for my first book tour, I went to all 50 states in the U.S. And people asked me how the planning for that took place, and there was no planning. I just thought it would be fun to do, you know. And then from there, kind of figure out where is it, where, how do I get there, what do I, you know, how does it come to, come to be? So I guess I like to break it down into very small steps. You know, honestly, um, so I can't answer the question for you directly. No. But I would say um, I don't know that it's possible to live in a cave and do that. And for me, what I do, the connection is very important. And uh, for at least a lot of the people that we talked about, um, they were very concerned with, um, with relationships and making something you know, meaningful. And that relies on building trust and loyalty and all of those kind of things. Um, so I don't know that you can really get away from that. I almost feel like that's central. What I would suggest is, you know, if that's uncomfortable, um, is it just the method? It's uncomfortable. Well, what, is there is there a different way that you yeah. can connect with people? What feels uncomfortable is that you feel like you're trying to sell stuff to people. And okay. Really want to okay. Them. Yeah. So that's almost a different question. You know, what what feels uncomfortable? He said is trying to sell something. That's different than engaging with people. You know, if you feel uncomfortable trying to sell something, are you still able to engage with people? Yeah. Are you still able to help people? You know, the more you can, you know, there's this model we talk about in the book of you know freely freely give, freely receive, and uh, you know, someone said, um, there was one young woman in the book who had a business uh, making custom wedding dresses and accessories. Uh, and she said, uh, you know, giving, strategic giving is my business plan. And she tried to give away as much as possible. You know, so it's not so much about selling, but I don't know that you can disconnect the engagement. Thanks. That's my advice. Yeah.
That's a great question. Um, does it address risk management? Uh, probably not, at least in a formal sense. Um, you know, not as that's understood mathematically. Uh, I guess what the hundred dollar startup model is about is about reducing risk. Uh, it's about you know encouraging people to start businesses without spending a lot of money, right? Um, so I would say you know let, let's take another example like an online business like the photography course we talked about, uh, or a number of people did ebooks, or people did consultancies or design firms or something like that. You know if, if you keep costs you know very low. Uh, one, you keep financial costs low, and then two, you keep uh, you know time to market costs low. You don't spend a lot of money, and you start the project within 30 days. You know, I would say uh, you know you start the project, and then we write a lot about market testing, how to know it will be successful or not. But I would say even if it's not successful, uh, it's not a huge loss, right? What I think is a huge loss is people borrowing large amounts of money for an unproven or uncertain idea. That is what I think is risky, you know. But I feel like um, just starting something, you know, is is not risky. Sure. Okay. Question about the original. I wrote a manifesto a while back called "A Brief Guide to Rural Domination," and then there was a follow-up, um, 279 Days to Overnight Success." He was asking how it gained traction, uh, and you said, "How did it gain, gain traction when it wasn't even selling anything?" That's part of the answer, <laughs> right there. You yeah, know, how did you get the way to have people find out about it? Sure. Um, I tried to write something that was interesting and useful and helpful. Uh, I work with a great designer. I think design is very important, um, so I, I don't want to take anything away from that. Like, she made it look really good. Um, I, by that point, I had been building a little bit of a community. It wasn't a huge community, but I had, you know, some readers. I mean, people often ask, how do I get readers to my blog? Or how do I get, you know, customers or leads or anything? Uh, you know, I would say, you first, you start with the people you know. Uh, when I started my blog, you know, I, I, I felt like I had done a number of interesting things in my life, but I wasn't a public figure in any way. But I still knew people, you know? And I wrote to my friends and colleagues and people I'd gone to university with, and said, I'm doing this project, and if you want to check it out, that'd be great. If not, no problem. And so I always say, if you have 10 readers to your blog or whatever it is you're trying to do, you know, you treat those 10 people like the most important people in the world, because they are, right? They're giving you their attention. You know, it's a very, um, you know, it's very hard to gain that. So if you have 10 people, you, you treat them very importantly, and then, then you have 15, then you have 100, and you just kind of maintain that interaction and engagement, and then it will grow. And then for the manifesto specifically, um, I, was, I was fortunate that my readers shared it. There wasn't a big strategy. There was no paid advertising. Uh, people just kind of passed it along. And I do think it's helpful to encourage that. I think it is good to say, like, if this helps you, please share it. Uh, it does help, you know, to make some specific requests. But I guess you just want to balance the number of requests with the value, hopefully, that you're providing. Seth Golden LinkedIn. And Seth Golden LinkedIn. That's great. Right. Right. And other people helped. Other people, other bloggers helped. You know, but they do that. You know, hopefully, because it's something that they felt uh, you know was interesting. You know, to share. <clears throat> you mentioned Seth Golden a moment ago. I mean, there's a beautiful book by Seth Golden called The Dip which deals with this exact question about when to quit and when to keep going, and it's an important distinction there. And, uh, um, and, and that answer will be different for everyone, um, but I do think there can be a strategic decision in quitting or in transitioning or in shifting, right? So that answer will be specific to your business, but I guess, um, I guess it's important to think about a couple of things. One, um, how is the market responding? You know, if you have some traction but not a lot of traction, then maybe you look and say, okay, what, what is going well with this and, and what is not? And what are people responding to or what are they ignoring? Um, and the other question is, I think it's always important, especially if, are you a solopreneur? Are you just doing this yourself? So then the next important question is, are you still motivated to do this? You know, is your heart still in it? Um, and, you know, if your heart is in it, then by all means, keep on trucking. You know, if not, then I think it's important to, to think about those things um, because I don't think you'll be able to sustain yourself in the long term with it if you're not really committed to it. We can all kind of do things that we need to do for a while, but you know, you have a chance to do something that's that's meaningful. So it's okay to change it up. I've changed up my business model many times. This is a great question. I'm not sure if I can rephrase it well, but she's asking. Uh, we often hear stories about people who have lost their jobs or they've otherwise been pushed. You know, to do something, uh, and so then they create this story. But what about those who still have the safety net? They want to make the change, but they're kind of you know in this situation. That's a great question. Uh, I would say we often hear stories about um, those moments of transition when someone loses their job or has a shock, uh, because you know when that happens, um, 
we kind of look at our lives and we, we're open to change in a way that we aren't otherwise sometimes. Um, but I think uh, it's, 